Thanks, Jim, for pulling this together. I've said this in public before, and I'll say it again now. I, I didn't want to work with cheatgrass at all when I took this job. Um, it is a huge problem, and uh, it's not really something that I wanted to spend a whole lot of time on. But as you can see, especially by the turnout today, um, it's an important issue for the state. May really touched on that well. She talked about not only the case that we're in now, but where we might go into the future if we can tip over and change that fire cycle um, and lose that sagebrush component, especially for something like sage grouse that May's already talked about. Such a huge issue, um, and it's affecting or has the potential to affect so many different management decisions that we make in the state. Um, for this talk, I'll, I'll try to keep it around 30 minutes. Mr. Mitchell said that I don't need to be too long-winded back there. Um, I'm going to touch mainly on chemical control in, in this part of the presentation. And I'm just going to kind of go through a list of pretty straightforward questions and try to provide some information to those questions. Um, one thing that I will touch on, since I don't know that it's included in another talk, is the use of fire for control. And May really address that really well. Fire facilitates sheet grass, makes it increase, and it reduces a lot of the perennial plants. Um, Steve Wisnett in the early 90s did some burning work in Utah and found that you can actually reduce a current year's seed crop by like 90% with burning. Um, but the problem is, in most cases, two or three years after that, it's already recovered. And that's partially because of the increased vigor in those plants, like the one that May showed the picture of. The other problem with using burning as a tool is if we're trying to maintain big sagebrush in those ecosystems and we start burning, then we've already, we've already eliminated the, the probability of maintaining that sagebrush. So um, in cases where there's wildfires, like we've had here, um, I think one of the most common options, as is with most weed control, is to use some kind of herbicidal control. So we'll, um, we'll talk about that a little bit. I have a tendency to roam around, so you can look at me or you can look at, look at the slides. This is probably more interesting to watch. Um, so overall, I'm going to touch on some of the herbicides that are currently labeled for cheatgrass control in range and pasture settings. There are some other things that are available for crop type situations, but we can't legally use them in range and pasture. Um, overall, some considerations when using chemical controls. These would probably apply to any kind of weed setting, not just with cheatgrass, but we'll focus on cheatgrass. And what can we expect to see? Um, how many people here have worked with herbicides on cheatgrass projects as of yet? Okay, some of you guys. Been happy with the results? Yes. Yes, so-so, yeah. so, so. so uh, it, it, it ranges. Part of that may have been um, tied into the, the state of the system at the time we applied the herbicide as well. So we'll kind of touch on that. Um, another thing that I'll just note by way of sort of housekeeping is that you'll notice we've got, um, we're making a video of, of the presentations. Jenny Thompson back there is doing a video. If you don't want to take notes, uh, we'll have these posted on a website that you guys can visit. Also, we're going to do some video out at the field site that we're going to visit after lunch and then come back next spring and evaluate some of the treatments that are out there so you guys can follow up and track the progress of, the, of that field site without having to drive back down to Wheatland for those of you that, that have come a long way. So we'll, um, we'll be sure on the sign-up sheet to get you the information how you, can, how you can follow with that. So why control cheatgrass? May's already touched on a lot of these issues. Uh, it can, by controlling cheatgrass, it'll be the, the opposite of the impacts. We can increase species diversity in some areas. Um, improvement of the forage base is really a, an important thing to consider for livestock production. Um, protect the perennial plant community. Um, largely I'm going to tie that to sagebrush, sagebrush ecosystem. Because I think in a lot of cases in Wyoming, we still have a good perennial sagebrush component that's left. Um, oftentimes we see sagebrush with a cheatgrass understory and I think those are areas that we, we might need to take some steps to try to protect it from tipping over um, to becoming an annual grassland system. And then I've got on here um, secondary invaders that are adapted to frequent disturbance. There are other things like rush skeleton weed, 
yellow star thistle, medusa head, other weeds that I think are probably even worse than cheatgrass that are facilitated by frequent fire return intervals that if we can get the seeds introduced into some of these areas then we may have an even bigger problem on our hands. So just look into the, to the future a little bit. Um, one of the questions that, that I've got, often gotten, I think Jim has gotten this question as well a few times, can I use herbicides to control cheatgrass without killing other grasses? Anybody want to answer that? No. Okay. Um, well, this is a picture of some research that we've got going over by Douglas. And um, all of the purple, you guys know what that is, right? That's the beast itself, cheatgrass. Uh, all of this green is predominantly blue gramma, some needle and thread, and some thread leaf sedge. And that was done. That's a couple different herbicide treatments. So we were able to successfully remove cheatgrass from the system at least for a time and not take out the other grasses. Okay? So it, it is possible. Um, we don't always get results that look that good. I, I was really happy with that and it stands out pretty well. Um, but that's kind of our goal, right? Is to remove the stress of cheatgrass, take that competitor out of the system like May was talking about. We've got greener forage longer into the season, so we don't have a two-week window that's, that's good grazing anymore. We might have a couple months. And then um, we'll talk a little bit more about production in those areas where we've removed cheatgrass. So which herbicides are available to manage cheatgrass and range of pasture? Oh, Grant, did you have a question? I just wanted to ask, was that a system with all cheatgrass or was there a mix when you first started that treatment? I'll let you guess. What do you think? I guess there was... So this is one year after treatment. Actually, that's eight months after treatment. So it was a cheatgrass with perennials still mixed in. Okay. And that's one, of the, that's one of the things that's tricky. When you're driving down the road, that looks like all cheatgrass, right? You've got you to know what's underneath there. Um, Blue Grandma doesn't really establish all that fast from seed, right? So, so that, that perennial mix was there. It was a perennial understory, and that's a really good point. I'm going to touch on that a little bit more earlier. Is We need to, we need to think about recovery potential um, to get results like that. So thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. It's a good point. So which, cheat, which herbicides are available? Um, there's a list. One of the things I'll say that the, 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 um, I guess the dirty little secret is that cheatgrass itself is easy to kill. It's a wimpy little plant. It's an annual. You can pull it up. It's dead for the year, right? But when you have about one cheatgrass plant and a couple million of its friends standing around, things become complicated. And part of that's because of a persistent seed bank that May talked about. Um, she said maybe five years that we still have seed that's viable in the soil. There's some data that suggests it may be longer than that. That a small percentage of uh, cheatgrass seeds may actually stay around for nine, maybe ten years. It's difficult to document seed longevity in the soil in natural conditions. So we don't know. We don't know how long we have to control it to fully deplete that seed bank. Um, this list here, I should have printed out for you guys. If you want the list, um, you, you uh, let me know and I can, I can maybe send an email around. It will also be available on this website. Um, you see right here that we've got at least one, two, three, four, five. So we've got six common, relatively commonly used herbicides that are labeled for cheatgrass control and range and pasture. Um, glyphosate, you guys have probably heard of Roundup right? Non-selective herbicide, um, but at lower rates we can actually increase the selectivity of Roundup um, to where the perennial plants will not be as damaged and we can get some cheatgrass control. I'm going to go into these a little bit more. <coughs> Mazepic, you guys have probably heard of Plateau. It's also now sold as panoramic. Are there any other, are there any other generics? Okay, um, probably the most widely used herbicide for cheatgrass control in rangelands. Um, it's been around for a long time. There's been a lot of research done. It's had some pretty good results. And we've also seen some cases where it didn't do so well. 
talk about some of the issues that might might play into that a uh, product called Journey which is a, a combination of Roundup and Plateau or glyphosate and Amazepic um, Matrix, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Landmark XP, it's been around for a little while. It's not one that I have really used that much, um, but I think I have some data about that one. If not, we can follow up. And then Cantor RNP, or Propoxy Carbazone Sodium. Um, just labeled for cheatgrass control and range in pasture this past year. Um, We'll touch on it a little bit more. One of the things that I, I want to point out um, is that some of these herbicides, we're, we're talking about applying at really low rates. You're like right around an ounce per acre, right? So there's, a lot of, there's not a whole lot of room for error. If you under apply, if you're not calibrated well, you're not going to get any control. If you're not calibrated well and you over apply with some of these, you can potentially kill a lot of your desirable plants. So um, I'll put that herbicide safety note out there. Calibration is important because it's going to affect the success of your, of, your of your project. So we'll go through these a little bit more in detail. Glyphosate or Roundup. Um, the plant needs to have been emerged and actively growing for uh, Roundup to be effective. So we've got on here it can be applied at low rates in early spring. Um, potentially we see a lot of emergence in the fall. Oftentimes if we have a wet fall, most of our cheatgrass emergence, at least in this part of the state, occurs in the fall. Then it overwinters as a little seedling and as May said, it's ready to push really early in the spring. Um, one of the problems with using something like Roundup in the fall, we don't have any soil persistence. Right? We're going to kill whatever's above ground, but if there's still seeds in there that haven't germinated, and we get more moisture or they can come back the next spring, they're going to germinate and come up. So we're going to have another flush of cheatgrass. We might, hey, we got it. We used Roundup and we killed it, and then we come back there in a little while and it's all come back. Right? It would be other plants that came back, but we would still have cheatgrass problem. Um, it can definitely damage other desirable vegetation. So if we can apply when our perennial species are dormant, which would be later in the fall or really, really early in the spring, then we can reduce, um, potentially reduce those injuries. Really useful in places where we have to reseed, right? because it doesn't have that soil persistence. Um, pretty cheap. This is probably going to be our cheapest option that we would talk about today. Plateau or panoramic? I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Um, I've seen the best luck using it as a pre-emergent in the fall. So before there's any newly growing cheatgrass seeds or cheatgrass plants. The seeds are there, right? It's got soil residual activity which means that if we can get it into the soil and maintain enough concentration for it to kill those newly germinating seedlings before they emerge, then, um, then we're going to have pretty good success. I'll touch on this a little bit more, but one of the important issues is that it needs to reach the soil surface to be active. That, that's going to apply to any of the pre-emergent herbicides or any that we're using pre-emergent. Plateau actually has some post-emergent activity and it's better if you can apply it, if you're going to use it post-emergent, before the plants get above about two inches tall. Right, the cheatgrass plants. Um, prices really come down lately. It used to be really expensive. I, I, I think three is, might be even less than that now. Um, and you're going to be somewhere in that four to eight ounce uh, rate if you're doing pre-emergence in the fall. Their label says you can also reseed following application. Um, and the, the BASF people indicate that you can reseed pretty quickly following application and that you'll have good luck. I think one of the things is if you spray first and then you drill back into there, you may create a little break in that herbicide coverage that those, that those plants can emerge through without being damaged. Um, hopefully we're not going to be dealing with a whole lot of situations where we have to reseed. Uh, so this is just an idea. This, is, um, this was in October. It's kind of hard to see. A little bit unfair because our perennials were brown at this point in time too. But um, 
you know, there's 80, 85% canopy coverage of cheatgrass there. Uh, six ounce per acre plateau applied last fall, and this was July of this year, exact same place. So you can see we've released some of the perennials that were there, um, and good, good control of cheatgrass. Glyphosate plus Amazepic or Journey. Um, this kind of gives you the best of both of those previous two options in that we can get some post-emergent control from the, from the glyphosate and then we can get um, that soil residual for any of the seeds that haven't yet emerged from the Amazepic. Um, again, we need to be careful with the desirable plants because we've got, um, we've got two herbicides that are basically non-selective. Um, this might be a good spring option if you've already got uh, emergence, if you've already got cheatgrass that's up and growing. Matrix, How many, has anybody worked with Matrix yet? Okay, so this was a potato herbicide originally. Um, and they found that it had really good activity on these annual grasses. And so there's a special label for restoration of rangelands that have been degraded by annual grass invasion. Right, you can apply anywhere, I think on their label says from one to three ounces of product per acre. Um, it's pretty safe on desirable species, but if you're gonna reseed back into an area that's been treated with matrix, there's a longer replant interval. It'll say that on the label, which means it'll have a, a desirable species that you wanna plant, hopefully, or one closely related, and it'll tell you if you apply this much matrix, you probably need to wait this long before you start to plant, okay? Something to keep, I mean, those labels, I mean, they're, uh, it's a legal and binding document, but there's actually some pretty good information on there. You should probably um, be sure to read those. Really effective um, on annual grasses and some effectiveness on, on annual mustards as well, which um, that's a pretty common combination that we see. We see annual mustards in conjunction with um, cheatgrass as well. So. Holden, uh, you guys met Holden a minute ago. He's modeling the hat. He's working on some cheatgrass uh, control projects. This is from one of his projects uh, over around Lingle. And this is uh, pounds of cheatgrass biomass production um, per acre with increasing rates of matrix and then increasing rates of plateau. Thanks, Holden. Um, Holden's taking classes and is busy right now. I didn't feel like it was fair to make him put together a full talk for this, but he's, uh, he's going to make a lot of progress. And, and if you guys have any questions, be sure to ask him at some point in time on the tour. He'll be able to answer them for you. Um, what we saw is that in this case, um, we're seeing that it looks like we're getting better control with matrix on cheatgrass um, than we were with plateau. Not really sure why that's happening yet. Holden's just now digging into those data, but um, it's more expensive, but it may be an option that, that is worth looking into depending on your situation. Uh, we got some reduction overall in, in, in uh, biomass production with Plateau. These are some of the higher rates, um, and this is our control that was untreated. So we were somewhere around 800 pounds per acre on average at that site for just sheetgrass production. So, two promising um, potentials there, and I would say these are probably the two that are being used most often now. Uh, Propoxy Carbazone, it's a newly ra uh, labeled rangeland product. Um, it's marketed as Cantor RNP, RNP being range and pasture. Um, supposed to be effective both pre-emergent and early post-emergent. And one side benefit is you might get some activity on foxtail barley as well. Um, I put this little blurb on here, don't wait until cheatgrass gets very large. I put out a set of trials last year um, with Cantor, well actually it was this spring, and I was a little bit late, and I think cheatgrass had five leaves on it, which is not all that big, and I didn't get very good control at all. So if you're going to do post-emergent, I think with any of these, catch it early before it can really get a whole lot of growth underneath it. Um, again, low rates. I have no idea what the market price is for Cantor. Don't have a price yet? It's a Wilbur Ellis product. Okay. It's 11, 11 something an ounce. Okay, so 11 something. So it's kind of in the intermediate price range between um, Plateau and, and uh, Matrix. It is another option, something to consider. 
So if, this is a big question, right? If I remove cheap grass, will I have more good grasses? Um, it depends. And this goes back to Grant's question. Um, are those desirable species still living? Are they there? You know, is there something there to respond to the removal of cheatgrass competition? Um, and then if not, um, if they're not there, you may have to reseed. Anybody here done any rangeland reseeding projects? Pretty tough sometimes to get newly seeded species to establish. Sorry, there's a fly getting around me. Um, and, and, and I... Uh, Especially, it's difficult to get new, newly seeded species established when there's cheatgrass competition in the setting. So you can see here, this is another one of those cover pictures. Um, the little cactus pads here for reference. Uh, there are good grasses there. And they did respond pretty well to the removal of cheatgrass. Um, Oh, this is oh, is this a little cartoon? One of the things to consider. This is just an illustration of of what Grant was talking about. You got all this cheat grass growing up top. We drive by it, or you ride your horse by it, or you look at it. You might not know that there's other little desirable perennials that are growing underneath there. And this is one of the things that we're going to look at when we go out to the field site today. Is how can you assess recovery potential? Um, we talk about vegetation cover, right? So if we drop the pin straight down like that little red line does, then we're going to hit cheat grass multiple times before we ever get down to a perennial grass. So we're going to talk about canopy cover versus basal cover and how that might be an indicator of recovery potential. And then there's little cheat grass seeds down there too that we have to worry about. Um, where high levels of cheat grass control is achieved, I'm going to say that, that the response may depend on the herbicide that's used. Um, Non-cheatgrass perennial forage can increase 200% or more. So that means in an untreated area with cheatgrass competition, we may have one half of the production that we would have in an area that we, that we removed it. And this is from a number of different studies around the state. I just kind of com compiled a bunch of data together. In some cases, we saw three or four fold increase in perennial grass production after removing cheatgrass. It's going to depend on the state of that system before we, before we apply. Um, what factors might affect my success? Um, so if we're doing pre-emergent, we've got to get our herbicide to the soil surface. We talked about that earlier, right? So if that were the case, we had bare soil and cheatgrass seeds that were laying there. Um, we got our herbicide pretty well distributed into the soil. We might have gotten some rain to move it down. Um, then we we're going to have pretty good luck. If we have emerged cheatgrass, it's already there right? We've still got to be able to get our herbicide to those plants. It's got to reach the plant, go into the plant and reach the active site in sufficient concentration to be toxic to that plant. What are some things that might keep it from getting there? Litter. Litter. That's one of the things that, that we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, or standing biomass, right? So here we've got our cheat grass and we've got seeds down here ready to germinate. Um, if we do an application pre-emergent and all of our herbicide gets tied up in this litter up here, then what is our success going to be? It's going to go away and then all our little cheatgrass guys are going to grow. So probably not that good, right? One of the cases that we've seen pretty often Oh, so this, this is just a, an illustration of that of interception of standing vegetation. So when we go out to the field site, we've got a few test plots. Um, when I was spraying, I put some blue dye in and I laid these little sheets down on the bottom at the soil surface, right? Um, one place we had a total canopy cover vegetation of around 94%. So if I look straight down, 94% of the ground surface was covered by vegetation. You can see I still got pretty good coverage. So blue spots are um, places where the solution actually met the soil surface. I had a rock on this one to keep the wind from blowing it away, so that's, that's, um, that's what happened there. So here we had um, total canopy cover vegetation around 99%. I'm sorry guys in the back, I don't know if you can see that, but you can see the difference, right? A lot of that solution, there's still a pretty good bit that made it, but a lot of that solution was intercepted and it never made it to the soil surface. So it may not be able to be active on pre-emergent on, on those seeds. Something to think about. Um, and we'll talk about this more in the field. Can I ask, what was the difference in, the, in those two sites then? Why did one reach more of the surface than the other? 
Um, so there was, on, there was a 5% total increase in vegetation canopy cover, right? Uh, this one has a lot more mustards in the overstory. This one's pri primarily cheatgrass. So we've got cover data that we're actually going to give out to you guys before we go out. Um, but it was primarily the, the major difference from a canopy cover standpoint was just an increase in total vegetation cover, which would have intercepted the spray. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, litter, so cheatgrass litter, other kind of litter that actually lays down and you get all these stems forming a little mat like this can sometimes really be even worse because it forms a near continuous coverage over the soil surface. So again, um, we spray, everything gets tied up in the litter, we don't get enough moisture to move it down. It can deteriorate, things like plateau will break down of sunlight um, and, and we don't get good control. So that's one of the things to consider. There's been some work done with litter removal and spraying and things like that. I think it's, it's a little bit inconclusive, but I think intuitively this makes sense to me. Right? Especially if we need to get it to the soil surface. Another option would be if we have some effective post-emergent herbicides that we talked about, wait till it emerges and then, and then go in and use that herbicide. So some concerns, um, return on investment. Herbicides can be expensive, and if we don't get the kind of return that we need, then uh, whether that be a financial return or some kind of habitat value return, then maybe, maybe we have to reevaluate. Um, how many years of control can we expect from a single treatment? Again, it depends. It depends on the system. Um, I've seen as much as four to five years of good control with a single treatment, a single application. Usually, I maybe see one and a half or two years. So um, it depends on a number of different factors, soil type, amount of moisture that we get. Um, can we permanently remove cheatgrass from our property? All right, sorry to be a buzzkill, but probably not. It's a part of the system. Um, it's going to be something that we have to commit to managing and hopefully reduce the negative impacts. Maybe we can use it as a forage source early and then turn a little bit of an asset into, into a, li or a liability into an asset. So a lot of options. Um, we'll talk about developing a strategy to, your, to fit your specific situation um, in a little bit and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we go out into the field. If those perennial plants are there, then our chance of recovery should be much higher than if we've waited until it's fully degraded and there are no perennial plants that are there. Um, and I think Rachel's probably going to touch on this one a little bit with the next talk. Um, a cheatgrass resistant community is probably not possible in, in our semi-arid rangelands. Um, we're talking about sagebrush bunch grass systems. Um, if there's free resources and free available soil, then there's a potential that regardless of how well you manage it, you may still have cheatgrass invasion. Excuse me, cheatgrass invasion. I'm getting choked up talking about how bad that, that situation is. <laughs> so um, I think I might be a little bit over. We're going to take a short break, but if there's any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Oh, I think Chris was up first. When you've got a lot of litter, is that when you utilize fire um, and entry post fire? I think that's a good idea. Something to remove that litter. Um, if there's sagebrush there, I would say no. If you're plant, if if you want to keep the sagebrush right for wildlife habitat, but maybe if it's a really degraded system and you're going to have to reseed, I think fire is a good pre herbicide uh, like site preparation. Um, another option might be cattle impact or livestock come in and graze it pretty heavy, remove that duff, break it up a little bit and um, I think you can get creative. You know another option if it's a really small area you can mow it and rake it, do something like that. Anything to decrease that interception but um, the added benefit of fire is that you may get some kill of seeds from that year as well. So. There were a few, sir. 
I was wondering, does cheatgrass become resistant to the herbicide like a lot of other weeds? There have been some uh, reports of herbicide resistant cheatgrass populations. As of now, we don't have any that we know of in Wyoming, which is another good thing that we have other options. So we can try to manage that resistance by switching up the herbicides that we use. You know, for a long time, if we were just going to do plateau, 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 then our probability of, of developing a resistant population increases. So there have been some reported in the, in the U.S., but not, not any that we're dealing with yet now. So, sir? Product not on your list is oust. Oust. That's some years ago. Started me on oust for springtime, but it's not on your list because because um, it's not one that's commonly used in in these settings, I guess. Okay. Um, what kind of luck did you have? Did you do well, pretty well, or okay? But it was strictly on the emergent, and it didn't control uh, new emergents. Um, however, the BLM in Idaho, as you probably know, was using oust aerial spray and incurred a huge bill from downwind farmers. There, there were some, there were some really, there were some really bad issues, and, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I didn't have it on my list too, I guess. Um, but yeah, it, it is effective. Um, it's gotten a lot of bad press, and there's some, you know, there's some bad. Uh, I won't say skeletons because a lot of people know about them, sir. Is there any uh, susceptibility to? Uh, Things like rust and so forth? So rust uh, pathogens that would affect cheatgrass. So there's a naturally occurring smut that we see. You guys have probably seen it in Wyoming. You walk through cheatgrass patches and that black smoke kind of flows up. Um, so that, uh, that does affect the seeds. And I think there's been some reports that it can reduce seed viability by pretty high percentages. But I'll go back to the numbers that May, show, May showed. If we have a really dense cheatgrass stand, with 20,000 seeds per meter squared, which equates to somewhere around 450 pounds per acre. Even if we get 80% seed reduction, then it's, it's not gonna be enough to really negatively impact population. There's some work in Washington with a soil active bacteria, Pseudomonas, it's a particular strain of Pseudomonas that seems to reduce the growth and vigor of cheatgrass and facilitate the growth and vigor of native plants. They're trying to bring that into market as a biological control. I want to get some and, and play with it here in Wyoming to see what kind of impacts we have. They've had a lot of good work in a little bit wetter systems. Um, and there was another commercial fungus that was called the Black Fingers of Death that somebody was working on to try to develop, and I just don't know if it ever panned out. He died. So, yeah, he died. So, I, one more. I think I'm way over time. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that play into that, right? Um, one of the things, if you if you come in right after the fire burned, and there's a lot of black carbon still on the surface, that can tie up your herbicide, right? So and then you won't get, and then it can blow away. Um, another thing, and Chris can potentially talk about this a little bit, did, did you know where the cheatgrass was before the fire burned? That's one thing that we, that we deal with that's difficult. You know, what, what is this one fire? It was 14,000 acres down here? You know, do we just go broadcast spray the entire thing if we don't know where there was cheatgrass to begin with? And we may have some negative impacts that come from that. Um, I, I have some data from the central part of the state that the first year after fire, we didn't see hardly any cheatgrass emergence at all. And then those second few years that came up, um, I would think I would usually wait and know where the cheatgrass is and then try to get a really good um, control in the areas where it was just from a cost effectiveness standpoint. Grant, you got anything to add to that? You guys have done some post-fire work, haven't you? Um, Ryan Amundsen here in town has done a lot more, but, but uh, I don't know, it's, it's a difficult situation because I mean, the cheap gas can quickly spread into areas that it wasn't before the fire too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, I think it's got to be more of a holistic approach than just 
spring. Yeah. And, and I think being ready to have several years worth of plan instead of just, hey, we're going to follow up one year post-fire. And I know sometimes that's dictated by emergency fire money or something like that. But um, looking a little bit longer term and taking a systems approach like Grant's talking about is probably the best option. I mean, those burned areas, especially south-facing slopes, recently burned areas, um, that's probably our highest risk for cheatgrass invasion and dominance in, in a lot of Wyoming. We see it other places, but um, you know, I would be ready if not the first year after, then the second, the second year after. So, sorry, that's kind of a, I didn't mean to evade your question, it's just that it's pretty tough. The thing about that though, with the, if you wait till the next year, then you've got that growth. And you, you do. You get as good a, a kill on the, or as good a job done, right? That's true. You could, you could wait till the following fall. You would know where the cheatgrass was, but it's had an opportunity to put another seed crop down in the soil. So it, it's, it's, and that's one of the things that we kind of hope to get through with this is, you know, if I've got a situation, what kind of questions can I ask to, to develop that strategy? And, um, you know, a lot of it is you just kind of have to plant your feet and say, this is what I'm going to try, and I think this is, is what we're going to do, and hopefully it'll work. So I, I can't give a recipe. Um, if I could, uh, we were talking on the way over here, if I knew how to get rid of cheatgrass, I'd probably be bow hunting for elk or something somewhere right now. Um, I don't know that I'd be. I don't know that I'd be here. Not that I don't like being here, but um, I'd probably have something else to do.